Welcome to the Career Now podcast. I'm your host, Jedley Henry, and on today's show, we have Ned Forney. Now, Ned has a long professional history in the military and in education, but now he is a writer based in South Korea, and by far away the most important researcher of the 1950 Hung Nam evacuation. On the 25th of June, 1950, the Korean War started. North Korean troops, backed by Stalin, invaded across the 38th parallel, and within a month had almost ended the war with South Korean and American troops holding on only to the southern city of Busan. However, soon enough, there was the Incheon landing, the retaking of Seoul, and the push north through North Korean territory up towards the divided line with China, the Yalu River. And this was something that Mao was always worried about. The closer the war got to his border, the more committed he became towards the fighting. And the first and most painful way that this manifested itself for American and South Korean troops was in the now infamous battle of the Chosun Reservoir. The horrors felt in this battle and the courage of American forces as they withdrew being attacked the whole way by overwhelming numbers of Chinese troops is now something of marine folklore. But what is less well known is the event that immediately followed. These soldiers pulled back to the only place they had available left to them, the eastern port city of Hungnam. By the time they arrived, Chinese troops had already surrounded them to the south. There was no land bridge back to South Korea. The only way out would be at sea. And joined in Hongnam, surrounded by attacking Chinese forces, being held off by an ever smaller perimeter of American soldiers, was 200,000 odd North Korean refugees fleeing the advancing Chinese just as the soldiers were themselves. There were over 100,000 soldiers, almost 20,000 vehicles, 350,000 tons of bulk cargo, and all in all, over 109 ships would be needed. And the man charged with executing this operation was Marine Colonel Edward H. Forney, Ned Forney's grandfather. And from arriving in Hongnam, they had a two-week window after which the port city would be dynamited, destroying it for use by Chinese and North Korean troops. All the while, the ships entering the harbor were dangerously close to Chinese fire. And so naturally, the American high command in this situation saw this as a military evacuation only. The 200,000 refugees were simply not in their plans. Together with Dr. Hyung Bong Hak, a North Korean servant with the Americans, Colonel Forney realized what would happen when the Chinese and North Korean troops arrived. They would lay eyes on hundreds of thousands of refugees of North Koreans who had chosen a side and simply by bad luck had been left behind. Their situation, if they remained, was dire. But after constant petitioning and with only a few days remaining, Colonel Forney and Dr. Hyun managed to convince the high command to allow refugees onto the last few remaining boats. And the scenes of this desperate evacuation are hard to fathom. Cargo vessels like the SS Meredith Victory, designed at any time to have no more than 100 crew on board, were leaving Hongnam Harbor and taking the three-day journey down to Busan with 14,000 North Korean refugees on board. Of the 100,000 refugees that managed to get out, there are over a million descendants now living in South Korea, including current president Moon Jae-in. And through examining this story and the role his grandfather played, Ned Forney opens up a deeply emotional and strangely ignored story that is increasingly now, in part due to the research by Ned, getting more and more play in popular media. And all this research will soon be available in an upcoming book by Ned Forney called Our Better Angels. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you want it to continue, please consider donating at the Patreon account attached below, www.patreon.com slash Henry. So without any further delay, this is Ned Forney. Ned Forney, welcome to the Korean Now podcast. Uh, thank you, Jed. Great to be here. So we're going to be talking through a fascinating story today, but uh, I, th- I think the first thing that we should do is get you to introduce your grandfather in this, so because he becomes quite a pivotal actor in the story that we're going to walk through here. Yeah, sure. So Colonel Edward H. Forney, uh, United States Marine Corps, I was born in 1909, uh, actually in Denver, Colorado. His father was involved in the in the uh, train business, and so the story starts really back then, you know, turn of the century in the United States. And uh, Colonel Forney grew up, um, poor family. His father, uh, his father was a heavy drinker, and so he had some hard times. Uh, him and his brother, 
and he ended up going to um, military high school in Washington, D.C. when the family moved back to the East Coast and then uh, got an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy. So he graduates uh, from the Naval Academy in 1931 and it's interesting when I when I write my book about this period, it's interesting to think about, you know, college guys at the Naval Academy or where, wherever they were uh, back then in the United States. And, you know, there's there's no drinking <laughs> uh, because it's prohibition. So people, I, th- I think sometimes they don't forget that there was prohibition. But, you know, just thinking back on what it was like for these guys to go to college and officially, you know, there was there was no alcohol in the United States. So anyway, he he graduates from the Naval Academy and then he eventually goes off into the Pacific to fight the Japanese during World War II. And uh, after the war, he, he becomes known as somewhat of a, an amphibious expert. You know, that's that's what the Marines are known for, hitting the beaches. And um, they did that quite a bit during World War II. So, so that's kind of the background uh, about my grandfather. But I do have to say this. Um, he died in 1965 at the age of 55, relatively young, from cancer. Uh, and I was only two years old. So this man that we'll be talking about quite a bit during the podcast, I, I never met uh, other than when I was a little baby. Yes, yes. And uh, I might introduce just uh, why, at least one of the factors why you think that cancer may have started, if that's all right. This sort of terrible um, misunderstanding about Nagasaki and some of the ra- the radioactive sort of fallout from that. Right. I'm actually, uh, in, in two weeks, I'll be going to Nagasaki to do a little research. Um, so at the end of the war, the U.S. Marines were sent into, into Japan to, as an occupying force and to also help rebuild uh, Japan. So he, uh, Colonel Forney, was a colonel at that time, full bird colonel, and he was sent to Nagasaki as an uh, artillery commander with his unit. And they went, uh, they were in Nagasaki probably two weeks after the bomb was dropped. So they're there, and, and I have all the, you know, the stories about the, the horrors that these Marines saw. You know, these Marines had been fighting in the Pacific, and they had seen, they had seen plenty, but nothing prepared them for what they saw, apparently, when they walked the streets of Nagasaki, and they saw these, these poor people who had been, you know, who were dying from nuclear radiation. So, so your question, then, is, is, is a great one, because we think that, um, the Colonel Forney obviously was exposed to radi- high levels of radiation at, at Nagasaki, and that was probably led to his cancer and him dying at such a young age. So let's launch into the story proper now that we've got that that demarked set there. So take us to June 19. Uh, so June 1950. Um, so the Korean War happens, and eventually Colonel Forney, and of course you mentioned earlier that he is an amphibious expert. So bring us to the start of of the Korean War. And then that Incheon land in which sort of breaks the backs and pushes us back up to, up to the Choson Reservoir, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah, sure. So it's interesting. When, when the Korean War breaks out, June 25th, 1950, Colonel Forney and his, and his friend, uh, Admiral James Doyle are both on uh, Admiral Doyle's command ship, um, off the coast of Japan and they're doing, um, amphibious, uh, practice landings with the U.S. Army. Because General MacArthur had, had asked the Marine Corps, um, this is probably 19, early 1950, had asked the Marine Corps, please send me uh, an amphibious expert and a, and a team of guys to train uh, the Army troops here, uh, you know, on, in Japan. Uh, General MacArthur was in charge of basically he was the, the governor of Japan at that point. So uh, Colonel Forney jumps on the plane with his uh, team, um, and they go to... Japan. They meet with him in Tokyo, and then they meet up with Admiral Doyle, and they begin doing this training. So it's just an interesting little side bit of history that on the on the day they find out that, uh, that the North Koreans have invaded across the 38th parallel, uh, Admiral Doyle, who will play a key role in many of the landings and in the Hunam evacuation as the, the the admiral for the for the Navy. And Colonel Forney, who's the guy on the ground, who's working with Admiral Doyle, they're both together when they get the news uh, on June 25th that the war started. So from that point, um, uh, MacArthur, you know, has this idea after he tells Walker, General Walker of the Eighth Army, to hold the Pusan perimeter that, you know, what he needs to do is an end run. 
and, and head up to Incheon, do an amphibious landing there against all odds, you know, with the, with the incredible tides, sometimes over 30 feet. Um, they're going to do this amphibious operation at Incheon. Well, MacArthur and General Almond, who's put in charge of 10th Corps, General Almond was his chief of staff in Tokyo, um, they're not the amphibious experts. So, of course, Colonel Forney and um, General Oliver P. Smith of the 1st Marine Division and Admiral Doyle, they all get together and create this big you know, team of experts, and they plan and execute the Incheon landing, which most of the Marines had advised MacArthur not to do. They, they said this, was, this would be a disaster. And MacArthur took a huge gamble. And it worked, and the Inchon landing was was a huge success. And from that success, the American troops, uh, I suppose in a way, have North Korea on the run, and they soon cross the um, 38th parallel, which is the which was and still is the dividing line, and they move up. And when they and they begin to advance towards a, a very important aspect of this, and where we're going to come to here, which is the uh, Chosun Reservoir, which of course is a very famous battle. I mean, also I suppose we should mention uh, otherwise named with the Korean name, the Changjing Reservoir. Yeah, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly though. But they push up there. So let's take us now to Chosun because this is where the heart of the story begins to really develop here. Right. So when the when the Marines uh after after Inchon, they they take Seoul just to back up just a little bit they, they liberate they liberate Seoul on September 28th and um, I do have to put in a little plug for the Rock Marines uh, my grandfather loved the Rock Marine Corps and he came back to Korea from 1957 to 1959 and, and worked closely with the Rock Marines but the Rock Marines also landed in Inchon and they also helped liberate Seoul and there's a great picture of rock marines raising the flag uh, in, in Seoul uh, on September 28th. And, so, and just for people listening, ROK, R-O-K, is the Republic of Korea. Yes, thank you, thank you. Mm. So there, they, um, the U.S. Marines, rock marines, they did, they did, uh, you know, train together and fight together uh, during the Korean War. So that's part of part of this story later on that develops why my grandfather comes back to to Korea, but. Um, they they liberate Seoul. Then MacArthur says, you know, go back to Incheon, back up, backtrack, go to Incheon. We're going to put you back on ships, and we're going to go back all the way around the peninsula, and then we're going to land at Wonsan. And, of course, that's what they do. But the big joke is um, that the the Rock Army uh, was in Wonsan by the time the Marines landed. So the Marines did not have to go into a, a hostile beachhead. They got there. The Rock Army had already liberated um, uh, hum, uh, Wonsan, and the big joke was that um, the U.S. Army was also there. Had beat the U.S. Marines there, and even Bob Hope was there before the U.S. Marines. Bob Hope was giving a big uh, a show for the troops, and he was there even before the Marines. So, a um, little bit of strange history there with uh, you know the Marines landing at the beach when when everyone's already there. But they get to Wonsan and then they start working their way up into up, up into North Korea, and this is where the weather begins to play a role because the weather starts to change and as they go deeper and deeper into the North Korean mountains and they get closer to the Yalu River, um, the weather becomes colder, snow, ice, um, wind, it's, it's really bad conditions. And, you know, one thing that MacArthur is faulted for, there, there are many things now, many of these books that have come out uh, recently in the last five to, to ten years, they all they all say that um, he had a very good idea that the that the Chinese would get involved if we came too close to to the Yalu River to Manchuria, and MacArthur ignored it. And the big question is why? Why did he ignore all the warnings? His intelligence, um, you know, he even flew over the Yalu River at one point in his plane. And he looked down and he said, I don't, I don't see any Chinese, so they're, they're not there. But they were, and I, I think he, he had a pretty good idea that they were. So it's, it's one of those things in history where, you know, these poor guys that end up at the Chosin Reservoir, the, the 1st Marine Division, the 31st Regimental Combat Team, there's also a group of um, Royal Commandos, 41 Royal Commando. These guys are in a, in a, in a position, in a spot that they shouldn't have been in. They're deep in the mountains of North Korea. There's snow. There's only one road to get up there. And all of a sudden now, there are literally 
tens of thousands of Chinese who have surrounded them. So that's an, a quite an amazing picture to imagine there. It's up in these frozen mountains. And uh, some of the imagery that you, that you can read and, and you can gather from this, from documentaries, is just a picture this. The ground was too frozen to dig foxholes. So it was very hard to even to even defend themselves here. So let's take us now to, to, to the fight itself. So the, the Chinese have entered, and they've entered quite uh, silently. It's like an odd sort of... This, uh, there is some interactions with, with, with Chinese soldiers. There's a, there's a few uh, battles and it's often ignored. But the Chinese have, uh, are fresh from their own, uh, guerrilla war across the border. And they come in and it's a quite a, a, a silent sort of movement. And very quickly, these Americans around the Chosen Reservoir are surrounded and it's really, really brutal, quick fighting. Okay. So let's take us to that. Just what happened there and how quick was the withdrawal from this area? Right. So on, on November 27th, just a few days after enjoying a, <clears throat> a uh, Thanksgiving dinner in the field, um, and and we have to remember also that uh, MacArthur, in, in in a way, and in, in in the press in America had kind of put it put out this uh, story about the 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 troops being home by Christmas, and that was the big promise. This was the you know we'll get you home by Christmas campaign. We'll push the to the final border. Uh, of, of North Korea and China, the, the peninsula will be liberated, and the war will be over. And so there was there was a lot of um, cocky talk from from the U.S. side, and of course Mao is listening to all this, and he's warned us repeatedly, please, you know, don't come up any closer, don't come up any closer, I will annihilate you if you come up this way. And he had even given speeches that were broadcast in Beijing that said he he was you know he was bragging that once the once the first Marine Division gets up there and they fall into the trap in these in the mountains of North Korea they will be annihilated and he he specifically you know said that um, this will this will bring about a, a quick end to the war so you're right they they sneak over the border and they do it um, during darkness during the day they hide out and they hide behind trees they stay in caves and you know so for the for aerial surveillance, it looks as if no one's there, but but they are. And we kept getting reports um, when we would capture some of these soldiers, and they would tell us, "Yeah, there's there's another you know hundred thousand Chinese in in the same area." And we were we just well not we, but I think MacArthur and um, and his the people the guys in Tokyo just didn't didn't believe it. So once on November 27th, once the fighting starts, um, it, it's quite eerie for these. For these U.S. Marines, for these uh, U.S. soldiers on the on the east side of the Chosin Reservoir, and for the Royal Commandos, because they the the Chinese would attack almost exclusively at night, and when they did, the American soldiers and Marines, and also there were rock soldiers there, Katusa, who were attached to the um, to the U.S. units. Um, they knew the assault was going to come because they would hear bugles, and they would hear whistles. And they would hear symbols, eerie sounds in the night and deathly cold. You know, it's some, in, in some cases it was minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so just bitterly cold. These men are, can barely fire their weapons. They're shaking so much. Sometimes their weapons don't even work. They hear the bugles going off. And then they said, and this is very strange, but they said they could, the minutes before the attack would take place, they could smell a huge wave of um, garlic smell. And apparently the, the Chinese soldiers ate lots of garlic. And they almost every veteran I talked to, they say, yes, we knew when the Chinese were coming because we could smell garlic. And so you can imagine the terror that these these young guys, 17, 18, 19 years old, and the, there was there were some uh, you know NCOs and officers who had fought in World War II. So thank God for for their leadership because these young guys, you know they 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 were they were reservists many of them, and now they were thrown into this into this terrible situation where they were outnumbered, um, approximately one hundred and twenty thousand Chinese and about thirty thousand um, UN forces. That is a very visceral understanding of just how close the fighting was to each other there. And of course, it's important to mention here that heading up to the Chosen Reservoir, it's a, it, it's a journey and it's really just one strip of road. It's not really a road, it's through the mountains and it's like a, a valley path. So, uh, 
soon enough, they they are surrounded here, and there is a decision that they're going to have to they're going to have to retreat. And there's this famous phrase that many listeners would have known about, even if they can't place the context. And that is, we're not retreating; we're just attacking in a different direction. And that becomes a sort of a, a, a comical thing in 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 pop culture. But in many ways, when you read about this 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 battle, it's absolutely true. They had been surrounded, and not only had they been surrounded, but the Chinese had come back around them and cut off the path behind them. So it doesn't matter where they were going. Yeah, they were retreating, but there is no way out of this fight. You're fighting no matter what direction you're going. So take us to that decision to to retreat and just how harrowing that evacuation was. Right.、Um, Colonel Forney does play a role in this decision to retreat. So. General Almond, who is the commander of Tenth Corps, that's the the army unit that um, that um, is the largest unit at the at、uh, at this point.、Uh, the first Marine Division is attached to the U.S. Army Tenth Corps. So the the first Marine Division reports to General Almond. General Almond is the op- officer in charge of the entire unit.、Um, so. When after November twenty seventh,、uh, when the Chinese come in full force,、um, MacArthur tells General Walker, who is also being hit hard by the Chinese、uh, on the western side of the peninsula, and General Almond, who's now on the east side, you know, at, at Chosun at Hunam and, and Chosun,、uh, he tells these two generals,、um, get on a plane, get over here to Tokyo. I need to talk to you immediately. And and it's interesting that you know during this entire It, that MacArthur is the UN commander.、Um, he not once spends a night in Korea. He never spends more than about four or five hours at a time on the peninsula. He flies in. He does what he needs to do. He meets with his, his commanders, and then he flies back to Tokyo. So he's criticized by many historians and many military experts for that. He didn't really have a, a good grasp of what was happening here. In the mountains of,、uh, of of Korea, so when he asks,、uh, when he orders、uh, Almond and Walker to fly to Tokyo, Almond then goes to General Forney. General Forney is Almond's deputy chief of staff. He's the only, he's the senior Marine Corps officer on General Almond's staff, and there's apparently a good relationship between these two men, General Almond. Respects Colonel Forney. Colonel Forney respects General Almond, and this was not the case for many of the U.S. Marine Corps officers. General Almond had a had a had a bad reputation, and he he did not get along well with General Smith, who is the general of the First Marine Division. It was it was they there was no love lost between these two men. So when General Almond heads over to Tokyo, he tells Colonel Forney, "I want you." To go up to the Chosun Reservoir and see what's going on. It was almost as if he didn't trust what General Smith was telling him, you know, how bad it was. So I think that says something for Colonel Forney that、um, General Almond trusted him to go up there and give him an accurate, unbiased report, even though Colonel Forney is a U.S. Marine. So Colonel Forney goes up and actually meets,、uh, gets up to Kotori. Which is、um, about five miles south of Hagaru Ri, which is where General Smith is. That's General Smith's headquarters. So he gets up there with Chesty Puller, the the famous Marine, most decorated Marine in in, in U.S. Marine Corps history, and they meet. And、um, Colonel Forney,、uh, about a day and a half later, comes back down from the from the reservoir, and he meets with General Almond. General Almond is back from Tokyo. And General Almond says, "Listen, give me the scoop. What's going on up there?" And Colonel Forney tells him. And from that moment on, apparently, General Almond was convinced. Yes, we cannot keep attacking because initially,、um, MacArthur and Almond kept saying, "Listen, this is just a, this. These are just skirmishes. Keep fighting. Keep attacking north." And、um, so now the the situation has changed. General Almond and MacArthur say it's time to retreat. So now, as you mentioned,、uh, General Smith says, "You know, retreat, hell. We're just attacking in another direction." And the stories about what these men went through, and what they endured, and the the, the casualties were horrendous. And it, as I wrote just recently in a in a blog,、um, the, the 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 veterans tell me that if you were injured, or if you were even wounded, anything happened to you at Chosun. If you could not move, if you could not walk and stand up and move, 
you you froze to death. So uh, a minor injury meant you died. So it was horrible fighting, um, hand-to-hand fighting in many cases, eye-to-eye. And, um, you know, a lot of these veterans also say that the U.S. veterans and British veterans, uh, they say that if they could meet some of these Chinese soldiers that they fought against, if they were still alive, um, they would shake their hands. Uh, they they have nothing against these these soldiers that were actually had it worse than the than the the Americans did, and their their the Chinese soldiers had sometimes sneakers tennis shoes that they were wearing in this you know minus thirty degree snow covered um, terrain, and they would look at their feet their feet were blocks of ice, and these Chinese soldiers would continue fighting so um, it was horrible for both sides of the uh, uh, on both sides of the battle line. So from that horrible retreat, so this is a 70-mile walk, and these troops have to walk it the whole way with Chinese soldiers, uh, basically surrounded the mountains around them, shooting at them almost almost the whole way. So here's so they begin to head, and they begin to head to um, Hongnan, which, which of course is the, um, the the pinnacle of this story and your grandfather's story. This fascinating story here. Now. Why did they choose this 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 particular port? Because this was a mass evacuation. Why did they choose this particular place? Right. So the the tenth court set up their headquarters uh, in Ham Hung, which is a town about ten miles inland from Hung Nam. So they had already brought in lots of ships at Hung Nam. They were familiar with the port. It was an outstanding port, um, perfect for what they needed. So what was going to happen is. Um, you know, as the as the Marines, as the U.S. Army units, as the entire Tenth Corps now has to retreat, um, they have to get out of North Korea as quickly as possible. They can't go by land. The Chinese have cut off the land route, and the only way to get out is by ship. And so, what they do is is uh, they call you know the Navy and uh, Merchant Marine plays a big role. Um, LSTs from Japan come over, get as many ships in there as you possibly can. Let's get these guys on, on the ships and get out of there as quickly as possible. But unlike Dunkirk, which is also, you know, it's the most famous evacuation of World War II and probably one of the most famous in military history, um, the difference between Hung Nam and Dunkirk is uh, MacArthur and Almond had said, when we leave Hung Nam, we are not leaving a single truck. Jeep, tank, we're leaving nothing behind. We're taking all our fuel. We're taking all our supplies. We're leaving nothing behind for the communists, um, which sounds good. You, you don't want to leave anything behind for them to later use. Um, but the trick is here, you have about a 10-day period where you have to load up about 105,000 troops and tons of equipment. Every tank, every vehicle, every, you know, just barrels full of, of, of fuel, um, thousands of barrels full of fuel. And so, you know, when they when they decided to put together the order to evacuate at Hung Nam, General Almond, of course, knows who he's going to pick to be the evacuation control officer. It's going to be Colonel Forney. He's the amphibious expert. And this is an amphibious landing in reverse. You do the same thing you're doing when you land, except you reverse it. So Colonel Forney um, is given the task of getting everyone out, and um, it's a big task. And and it's not he is he is yes the evacuation control officer, but he has a huge team of of, of men working for him. And so he, I think, if he were alive, he would not take credit, you know, for what happened. He would say, yes, I, I was I was in, in charge. But it's amazing what his team did, and they were experts. Every one of these guys. And loading the ships, knowing what you could put on this ship versus that ship, and how to schedule it so you didn't have people backed up on the beach. And so it was. It's it's the uh, one of the largest military evacuations in U.S. military history, and it is also the the largest um, amphibious evacuation of civilians under combat conditions in American history, because. Um, there were also refugees there, and um, refugees also get out, 100,000 refugees. Well, that's a, a good element to bring in here because we haven't touched on that yet. So as these Americans are are, are, are evacuating, are, are retreating, they're increasingly being uh, joined on the way back 
by North Koreans themselves who, who flee the fighting and are, and are joining the Americans. So it's bringing this, this refugee North Korean element. Why, why were these people fleeing so much? I mean, they were, in a sense, North Koreans and Chinese were fighting on their side as well, uh, technically, I suppose. And uh, what were they expecting? From, from, from the Americans? Had they been given any uh, thoughts that they might be evacuated with the Americans? Right. So, you know, as the, as the, the ROK Army and the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines, as they move across the 38th parallel and they go up into the mountains of North Korea and they keep pushing towards the Yalu, um, you know, Pyongyang and many of the, all the big towns in Korea are, are liberated. And, Many of these North Korean civilians, you know, they had lived under communism since 1945. And I've interviewed uh, at least 30 of these former North Korean refugees. Some are now American citizens. Most live here uh, in Korea. Um, and, you know, they tell me that for different reasons, sometimes religious reasons, sometimes uh, financial reasons, sometimes ideological reasons, um, they did not... By 1950, they realized that they didn't want to live under a communist uh, regime. Um, they did not like what Kim Il-sung was doing to their country. And so when the UN forces and ROC forces move into North Korea, it's the perfect chance to start um, going across the border into South Korea. And there's a huge influx of, of North Korean refugees flooding into South Korea at that point. So, so the refugees who are up near uh, Chosen in, in, in northeast uh, North Korea, when this battle is, is going on and the Chinese are coming in to their villages and to their towns and to their cities, um, many atrocities occur. And um, atrocities on both sides, though, we, we do have to point out that these atrocities were not just conducted by the North Koreans and the, the Chinese. There were plenty of atrocities conducted you know, on the other side too. So there's a there's no um, there's a lot of hate that's that's uh, and, and mistrust between the two sides. So when the decision comes down that the that the Americans are uh, evacuating, many of these North Koreans then decide, well, I'll I'll follow along with the Americans, and then there's a big rumor circulating throughout these cities and towns and villages that if you get to Hunan, there are American ships there. And that was true. There were. And if you're really lucky, maybe some of these American ships will let you board the ship so you can escape because there was no way to escape by land. So tens of thousands. At one point, there was probably over 200,000 refugees at Hunan. And some of them are, are thinking, I will return in three days. There's a very famous book called The Three Day Promise written by a North Korean a refugee. And many of these uh, men and women left families behind, left grandparents behind, sometimes left children behind and said, don't worry, we'll be back in three days because they were convinced that the Americans would, would, would come back and push the Chinese out of North Korea and Korea would be, um, would, would be, um, liberated. North Korea would be liberated and the peninsula would be unified. So, um, there are many different reasons why the North Koreans left. Um, but I think it's, it's, they, they were, they were hoping to at least temporarily get out of the, the, the combat situation and in, and in some cases also they wanted to go south. They wanted to be free. And you just touched on it there, and it's important to, to, to I guess, enter the discussion at this point. So the American troops have, have are evacuating and the uh, North Korean refugees are moving with them and they move into this port. And you mentioned it there that they couldn't move out by land because the Chinese forces, they weren't just chasing the American troops. They were they were fighting for the North Koreans in a war for the Korean Peninsula. And they'd pushed down south of Hung Nam Port. So there, there literally was no way out. So that's the scene there being set. They were, at least from what I read, they were absolutely boxed in. At a certain point, there was no way out. It was only by sea. Exactly. And that, that's, the, that's the dilemma that these refugees are in because now you have to imagine it, it once the Americans pull out and, and these refugees can see the Americans getting on the ships the troops left first um, the equipment left second and then at the end 
the refugees left. But until the refugees saw other refugees leaving, they didn't know what was going to happen. So they've taken a huge gamble. They've now, with all their their gear on their backs and, you know, sacks of cold weather clothes and any, you know, personal belongings they could just grab in the last minute as they left, they've, they've put all this stuff in, in big bags and big sacks, and now they're sitting there at Hunam. So they know what's going to happen if they don't get on those ships. When the Chinese finally do take the city after we leave the port, uh, you can imagine if you're a Chinese soldier, if you're one of the Chinese commanders, and you see all these North Koreans who have risked their life to get on an American ship, you obviously know which side, uh, whose side these, these people are on. And um, we do have reports that uh, from people who uh, ended up being in the North Korean army later and then defected and were there that um, many of the refugees who got left behind were, were killed. And if they weren't killed, they were definitely put in prisons or sent to, you know, coal mining centers and, and their, their lives as they knew it were over. So you can just imagine the fear of these poor refugees on the beaches in the freezing cold. Um, little to no water or food, um, and they've been on the run now for you know sometime up to you know ten days out in the freezing cold, and they're just praying that they can get on one of these uh, American ships. And this is where um, Dr. Hyun Bong Hak, a a South Korean man, but actually he had been born in in, in Ham Hung. Ham Hung was his hometown, so he knew many people at Ham Hung and Hung Nam. That's where he grew up. And he was a civil affairs officer attached to 10th Corps. And what this means is um, he spoke excellent English. He had gone to school in the United States, actually in Richmond, Virginia. And General Almond was from Virginia. Colonel uh, Dr. Yun actually spoke English with a little bit of a southern accent. And so General Almond w- was intrigued by this when he first met Dr. Hyun and and um, Doc, General Almond eventually said to Dr. Hyun, listen, I want you to come work for me, and you're going to be my civil affairs officer up in Ham Hung, which is your hometown, which is where 10th Corps set up their headquarters. So Dr. Hyun um, becomes good friends with um, Colonel Forning. Uh, they somehow, they, they hit it off. They meet in October, and so for the next three months, they're together Um Colonel Forney is in the 10th Corps um, command staff, and so is Dr. Hyun. And so Dr. Hyun, when he sees all these refugees um, shivering on the water's edge in Hung Nam, he goes to General Almond, and he goes to any officer he can find and says, listen, you know, <clears throat> what about the refugees? You're going to take them, right? And repeatedly he is told, no, we're not going to take them. This is war. The troops come first. The equipment comes first. We can't put civilians on Navy ships. There's no room for them. It's a security risk, and we're really sorry. Um, So that's not what he wants to hear. He then goes to Colonel Forney. You know, Colonel Forney is the evacuation control officer, and Colonel Forney is his friend. And he says, you know, know, what do you think? And and Colonel Forney says, um, you know, the word impossible is not in our dictionary. We, we can maybe figure this out. I'll get a hold of Admiral Doyle. We'll try to pull something together, and let's just see. And let's go back to General Almond, and let's talk to him again. So they do. And, you know, to make a long story short, they, they finally make the decision towards the very end of the evacuation that, yes, the, the civilians, they're on the, on the shore there, over 200,000 can get on the ships. Um, so it's a great story about, uh, Dr. Hyun's, you know, perseverance and, and, and his friendship, um, with Colonel Forney and General Almond. And so these, all these men come together and Admiral Doyle, who always gets forgotten because he's the Navy guy. He's on, he's on the, he's out in the harbor, but he played a huge role. So all these people come together at the last minute, basically, and 100,000 refugees are rescued. Um, but as I said, there were, there were 200,000 refugees there. So the, the part of the story that, um, you know, the, the Hollywood uh, film producer probably won't want to put in the movie is that, um, you know, yes, we rescued 100,000 refugees, but we also left just about that many behind. And at that moment and on that point, uh, we need to introduce here something that there, there was a deadline. There was a Christmas Eve deadline for this. Uh, so your grandfather had effectively two weeks 
to clear the area out. So you can see the pressure to get as much military op uh, personnel and operations and, uh, and uh, hardware on these boats as fast as possible. But then also the last minute panic to then include refugees into this, in, into this particular um, uh, evacuation is quite a, a, a strange sort of uh, panicky last minute sort of uh, um, skin of your teeth kind of operation, isn't it? That's right. And, and that's the, you know, I, I've looked and I've gone to the archives in, 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 in the United States and done research here in Korea and looked at all these after action reports and telegrams that were sent between Tokyo and, and, um, and the 10th Corps. You know, who officially gave the, the, gave the final word to say, yes, evacuate the refugees? Um, we, we can't find that. And I think that's because no one, you know, for MacArthur, um, to, to rescue the refugees, that was not on his agenda at that point. I'm not saying he didn't want to, but he had other things to think about, um, his career for one thing, you know, because at this point his, his big gamble, um, has, has gone, uh, terribly wrong and, 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 you know, thousands of Americans are dying. Um, so, and then General Almond is, you know, now thinking about his men who are down in, in um, Busan because his men have all relocated down there. And so there's just a handful of guys left, you know, defending the perimeter from the Chinese coming into the city and to the port. And then there's Admiral Doyle right there on his ship. And so, you know, who actually made the decision? I don't think it was an official decision. But I do have to say this. Even when the initial orders went out to evacuate from Hunnam, in the initial operation order, at the very bottom, it did say refugees could could go out. It said it said thirty thousand, and so I think the the idea was that there were there were many of these. They didn't say actually refugees. They said they said North Koreans. These would be people who had helped the American um, soldiers, who had helped the American government, who had possibly worked for the American government. We can't leave them behind for sure. So we did have in the operation order. Uh, you know, a little sentence at the end that said, yeah, we were going to take out some some Korean civilians, North Korean civilians. But to take out 100,000 refugees, just people we don't know that did not work for the government. You know, technically, these are these are the North Korean enemy um, to put them on Navy ships. Um, that was just a huge risk. And, and, you know, it's something to think about. You know, it's a good story now. You know, we rescued 100,000 refugees. Some of these ships, one in particular, the Meredith Victory, which is the most famous ship of the evacuation, it's the ship that Moon Jae-in's parents were on, and 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 14,000 refugees on this one ship. Um, it, it it would it would be a terrible story if one of these ships with 14,000 or 10,000 refugees crammed, literally crammed. It was like being on the metro, you know, during rush hour. There was no place to sit. There was no place to sleep. There was no place to go to the bathroom. There was no food. There was no water. And sometimes they were on these ships for two or three days um, down below decks. If one of these ships had, had sunk, had been hit by a torpedo or a mine or, you know, something had happened, something had gone wrong, I think the people in the United States and the people in South Korea would want to know who gave permission for these civilians to get on Navy ships. So I admire, you know, Admiral Doyle and Colonel Forney and these people who said, um, you know what, we're going against regulations, but we're going to do it anyway. And uh, it is important there that you brought in the SS Meredith Vic uh, victory. It's one of the famous stories of this. But as you said, it 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 came down towards Busan Harbor, three day trip, fourteen thousand people on board. Now this was a merchant ship that at this point it was all hands on deck, as many ships as you could get into that harbor to evacuate people. But the U.S. Victory, um, Meredith Victory, at least from my understanding. Uh, was designed to have less than a hundred crew on board and they had 14,000 people crammed into it as it came down the port here. And, uh, throughout this evacuation, one of the, one of the things that, that, that came across, and this is, I suppose, a new thing in warfare at this time, is that this was often being live reported back in, in, in America. You'll read in news reports and you had these famous, uh, PR reports and, uh, statements by people like, uh, President Truman talking about how this was one of the proudest moments of the war for them. Yeah, that's right. There's a great uh, article in New York Times. It was, uh, so on Christmas Day, so the, the, the evacuation ends, 
at 2 p.m. on December 24th, 1950. And at that point, the entire port has been rigged with explosives, dynamite, um, TNT, leftover ammunition that was too old. We couldn't take it. Um, it was unstable. So we, we rig all this stuff, and then we get the last guys out. Unfortunately, there's still 100,000 refugees over on to the, over at the side of the, of the port, and some of them were killed in this explosion. Uh, we blow the port, and the idea was we did not want the North Koreans using that port, um, and they didn't. It would take a long time to reconstruct the port. So we, we destroy the entire port, and then we, then we pull out. And Admiral Doyle, interestingly, um, in, in, in an article he wrote uh, years later, he looked out with his binoculars. As they pulled out of Hungnam Port right before the explosion took place, and he could see, he estimated at least a hundred thousand refugees still there on the water's edge, still outside the city, hoping to leave. And that's the heartbreaking part about this story. I mean, there, it's such a great humanitarian story that one hundred thousand refugees were rescued, um, an estimated one million descendants of those refugees now live in freedom. But it was also the, the poor refugees who were left behind. And, and, you, and you brought up the reason for that is that the pressure from the Chinese was so intense that we knew that if, if we didn't um, get out of there fast, the, it was, the, you know, we could get totally wiped out. And also the, the Chinese were getting ready to take Seoul, um, so, which they did. Um, you know, Seoul exchanged hands three times. So... Um, I mean, yeah. that, that, that is an important element there that is often missed in this. So as these boats are evacuated and they're coming down to Pusan, which of course, for people that don't know, it's in the very south, uh, southern point of, uh, of, of the Korean mainland, they're, be they're in effect, they're racing Chinese troops. Because the Chinese troops are just pouring down the down down the down the uh, the peninsula. There's very little uh, stopping them at this point, and they're racing them down to Busan. And when they get down there, in, in fact, there's some some of these boats can't actually unload when they get to Busan because it's just not safe enough, and they have to go up to islands off the coast like Gojido and unload uh, um, their uh, humanitarian cargo there. Right. Yeah. So Gojido becomes the um, the. That's where the merit of victory, it, it, like exactly as you said, it goes into Busan, and it's, and it's kind of a strange part of the story. They, when they get to Busan, it's Christmas Eve, and there's kind of you know the no room at the end story, and so they get to Busan, and there's there's no room for them. They're told um, the, the 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 port is packed, and like you said, you know no one knows what's going to happen, and they say. You know, you have to go now another four or five hours south to this island called Kojedo. And um, you can imagine the, 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 the crew of the Meredith Victory and then the poor 14,000 refugees who are on that ship who haven't had anything to eat or drink for now two and a half days. And they've been standing up and they've been going to the bathroom on the floor. And, you know, they, they said it was just the conditions were horrible. Lice. And the poor babies, five babies were born on the ship during the voyage. And they get to Busan and they're told, sorry, you can't unload. And so that adds another at least uh, 15 to 24 hours to their to their trip. Because once they get to Koje, they can't unload because they have to wait for LSTs to come on the port and starboard side of the ship so that the people can unload onto the LSTs, which are flat bottom ships that can then land on the beach. And so it takes hours for all these refugees to unload. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a miracle, actually, that in this voyage that took almost three days, the Meredith Victory's voyage, not one refugee died. And when they unload, they actually have five new passengers, these, these five babies, you know, who were born on the ship. And it's a great little story, but the, the, the merchant mariners on, on the ship, you know, they, they don't know Korean, um, but they, they do know a few words. And so when the first baby is born, um, they, they think this is, a, you know, what a, what a great story. A baby was born on our ship. It's never happened before. And they're, they're, they're excited and they go, the rumor starts spreading throughout the ship. A baby was born on the ship. And of course, the, you know, the, the men, the Americans want to have a name for this baby. And, um, and so kind of jokingly, but, but I think also it was just a way to, to, to give some uh, recognition to, to the, the family and to the, the, the little baby. They say, you know, we have to name it. 
And so they don't know any Korean, so they just say, well, we, there is one word we know, kimchi. <laughs> <laughs> so so they, they call the little baby kimchi. All right, that sounds great, and, and it works. But then five hours later, another baby is born. So what do they call that baby? Well, they call that baby kimchi too. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, by the end of the voyage, the last baby that's born before they um, – um, get off the ship at, 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 at um, Kojedo, uh, Kimchi 5. And um, I have met Kimchi 1 and Kimchi 5, two men who now live, uh, one lives here in Seoul, one still lives in Kojedo. He's a veterinarian down there. He's a, he's a, a cow specialist. Um, they are both great guys, and they talk about how thankful they are that the that the Americans, you know, evacuated their their parents and that they were born in freedom. And they frequently become emotional when they talk about the story about how they were born on the ship. And it's just it's just an amazing story. Captain Leonard LaRue, the captain of the Meredith Victory, his famous quote is, God's own hand was at the helm of my ship. And he later um, left the merchant uh, merchant marines and became a Benedictine monk. And lived the rest of his life in a monastery up in uh, up in New Jersey. Yeah, it's an absolutely fascinating story that. But you just touched on, on I suppose, the most important aspect of this uh, as as we look back on the story now, which is those refugees. So this is a fascinating story of a hundred thousand refugees getting on those boats and the tragedy of a hundred thousand left behind. And uh, as you mentioned, there's now a million descendants of these people of of these refugees now living inside South Korea, and. Before we get to some of the of the, uh, the personal interactions that you've had, let's talk about one that you mentioned there, the famous one, someone that has brought this uh, this incident back 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 to life for many people, and that's President Moon Jae-in. His parents were on that boat, and two years later, he was born in South Korea. Yeah, that's right. It's just a, a strange twist of fate, isn't it? To think that you know his parents escaped from the communists. They they left North Korea, never to return. Um, and that's that's another thing I want to point out. You know, so many people say, well, you know, so these refugees, when they left and they got on the Meredith Victory, they got on all these LSTs, they escaped. Um, you know, they you you, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that they left many family members behind. And the sad, the 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 terrible part of many terrible parts of the story, but one of them is that you know these poor people when they when they came south, they never again even heard a word from their relatives. No letters, no telegrams, no telephone calls, and of course nowadays emails, nothing. They have no idea what happened to their family members and, and uh, many Americans find that hard to believe. They're like, well, wait a minute, it's just, it's just right up the road. You know, can't they, there's no way they can communicate with their relatives. They're, they're just right up above the 38th parallel. There's no way. And, and many of them, even, even if they could figure out a way, sometimes you can get Chinese to go into North Korea, um, Chinese civilians, uh, these kind of agent type people who will go in there and, and try to find your, rel your long lost relatives. Many of them won't even do that because they can't trust, first of all, if the, if the people are going to tell them the truth about what their family members are doing. Um, but also it puts their family at risk um, because a lot of these family members um, told the communist government after their loved ones left, you know, now the, the communist troops come in and the, 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 the agents want to know, you know, where's your husband and where's your son? They would just say they got taken away by the army and they were probably killed because you don't want to tell, you know, um, the North Korean regime um, that, yes, they escaped and they, they got on ships and they, they went south. That's the last thing you want to tell them because then you're going to end up in, in a prison camp. So it's a terrible story, but but the the refugees who made it um, to to Koje and to Busan, they started their lives from scratch, and what they did is amazing. Uh, they worked hard, and they became you know great uh, South Korean citizens. They loved their freedom. They loved their religious freedom. Many of these um, refugees were Christian, and they're um, they're proud of of their ancestry. They're proud that they were from North Korea, but they're they're more proud of what South Korea has done, and they are loyal South Korean um, citizens, and they, they, they love this country, and they're so grateful for, um, you know, being able to escape because they know the fate that was in store for them if they didn't get on those ships or if they, if they had just stayed in their villages. So it's a, uh, yeah. 
So let's touch on some of those refugees because you've done a lot of research in this area. And some of it, of course, has been interviewing people that were escaping, often as very young children, I suppose, at the time. Um, so let's touch on some of these things. One of the things that came through in, re in reading some of your research is just how thankful they were because they were in this port. And they real and of course, it, it, the Chinese were so close to the port that in some cases it was too risky, or well, considered too risky, even though the, um, they still did it, but considered too risky for some of the ships to come into the port itself. So they knew how close the Chinese were, and they knew it was the Americans that were, hold that were, that were holding them back. So they uh, seemed to be incredibly grateful towards America, um, and of course the ROK forces at this time. Yeah, they they are, and, and they they in, in all the interviews that I've done, it, it comes through loud and clear that um, that they they're grateful, and and they also want this strong U.S. rock alliance to, to remain in place. Um, they're, they're very nervous, you know, about you know what would happen if 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 um, our alliance you know somehow deteriorated or. Fell apart, and, and I, I, I'm convinced that it won't. I mean, I think that the bonds between the United States and Korea are very strong, and that's one of the themes of of my book and many of the articles that I write and blogs that I do is is Korean American friendship. It, it's there's there's a special connection between our two countries, and um, and the refugees want that connection to to remain. Many of them have family members who live in America, um, so it's 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 a it's a great story and. You know, there's something when I when I interview these men and women now in their 80s and 90s. Of course, in many cases, they look like they're six, in their 60s and 70s. They're incredible, <laughs> their their health and their vigor. Um, yes, there's something very special about seeing the gratitude in their faces. Just just amazing, really. And uh, one of the one of one of the issues that comes across in the media a lot is this um, family reunification. Of course, the re the reunification of of the peninsula itself is always there, but failing that, there's this idea that that these separated families should be allowed to re uh, reconnect. And often, and in many ways, and of course, this comes across in the movie, which I suppose we can talk about now, which is Ode to My Father, which this this was a very strong theme of that. That these families spent a lot of their lives uh, desperate to reconnect to the people that they'd left behind. Because, as you mentioned here, half were left behind. So this was um, fathers leaving behind uh, wives and brothers leaving behind sisters and etc. Yeah, it's it's heartbreaking. And whenever they, I ask them the question usually at the end of the interview, can you tell me specifically where you were, what you did, what you were wearing, what was happening when you said goodbye to your family? They all remember. Exactly, and then they all cry. So, so their their emotions are still so raw. And you think, well, that was you know that was sixty eight years ago. I mean, haven't ha you know? You would think it would have gotten a little bit easier, but it hasn't. And these these you know, these old old men and women, they're they're determined that they they want to live long enough so they can go back to their hometown. That's that's what they tell me over and over again. And as an important final element to bring into this is the American veterans. So over the past few years, there's been a, a this, I mean, you're quite aware of this, there's been programs to bring back in um, these troops, these UN and American troops back to Korea. So I might get you to mention this and talk through the experiences of these returning veterans now to a very different South Korea from what they left behind. Right. The, the, um, the Korean government uh, has a program where they uh, pay almost almost the entire um, ticket for for um, servicemen uh, from all UN forces. So this goes across the board, not just Americans. All UN forces, um, men who fought here, they can come to Korea. It's, it's about a five day period, um, and they are treated extremely well, and they stay at very nice hotels, and they get taken here and there, and and you know they they are you know movie stars basically while they're here and it's so great to see um, these these veterans come back and they too get teary-eyed when they realize you know what South Korea has become in many in most cases these men have never been back since since 1950 or 1951 through 53 and so now they're coming back to this amazing country a democracy 12th largest economy in the world huge you know the skyscrapers the wonderful han river now and the bridges and everything that they see and they and they say i should have come years ago because 
I always had questions on whether or not my buddies died, you know, uh, for for a good cause. And when they see what South Korea has done with their freedom, they know. So that might be a great moment to end this on here. That's it's, so. It's, I've really enjoyed this. This has been such a, a fascinating, emotional story to talk through, and one that's not told enough. So I think the research you're doing here is is vitally important. And uh, we should mention that you, despite having published a lot online, and they can find it. I'm going to link your website to this podcast. You have a book coming out, so I should get you to introduce that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jess. Sure. So, <laughs> so the book is um, um, called Our Better Angels, and, and yeah, that comes from Lincoln's inaugural um, address um, before the Civil War. And you know, he was asking Americans to to listen to your better angels, do the right thing. Um, and in this context, I think what happened at Hunnam, there were there were key people that did listen to their better angels because. You know, it would have been so easy to tell those refugees, you know, sorry, we, we already took the people we could. There's no room. We can't risk our crew members. We can't risk uh, the, the guys, our, our military men to save, you know, these refugees. And, and we just can't do that. You know, we're really sorry. And, and that would have been the end of the story. But they did listen to their better angels. So I think it's, it's hopefully a, um, a theme that will resonate throughout the book and, and, um, and get people to notice that, you know, war, first and foremost, is terrible. And we, we do not want war. Um, and we don't, we do not want war on the Korean Peninsula. Um, but, you know, through, um, this war, some good things did happen. And so this humanitarian operation was one of them. And, and South Korea today, is a is a shining example of what these men who sacrificed their lives and the families who lost their their sons and their you know their brothers and their fathers. <clears throat> so it's um the book Our Better Angels uh will hopefully be published in the United States and then um, translated uh into Korean because I think it's a it's a story that that needs to be um to be told on both sides of the Pacific. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Ned Forney, thanks for coming on the Korean Out podcast. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it.